Let us pray. A great God in heaven, we thank you for bringing us together in fellowship today so we can learn one of the most important things in the Christian life. Father, we pray as we come to this important subject of the ministry of praying today that you will teach us how to pray and lead us into real praying and make our lives a continual offering of praying and worship before you in Jesus' name. Father, we pray that you will help every one of us to discover the power, the authority in praying and to know how we can change the history of our own family, the history of people around us, the history of society around us by the power of prayer. Father, we look up to you today that will teach us in the word as we look at this subject. Lord Jesus, we come before you. As the disciples came to you in the days of old, saying, teach us how to pray. We say the same thing with all our heart, with all our desire, that Lord, from this very day, by your spirit and in your word, teach us how to pray. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. Today we continue in our study of the epistle to the Colossians. Colossians chapter 4. We're studying verses 2, 3, and 4. Continue in prayer and watch in the same way thanksgiving without praying also for us that God will open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bond, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Today we are considering our prayer ministry. Prayer is an important part of the life of every believer and of the life of the whole church. Prayer is the divinely appointed weapon against the temptations and attacks of the devil and its demons. Prayer is the means by which the grateful soul pours out its praise before the throne of God. We can say that prayer sometimes could be the voice of weeping, calling on the sympathetic Father in the time of need. And we can add that prayer could be the intercession of the concerned Christian who calls for divine resources on behalf of other people. Prayer must be toward God in line with the spirit's mind, in accordance with God's revealed will in Scripture, and in the name of Jesus Christ. Four things we need to notice about prayer. Wherever we are praying, whatever we are praying for, what situation we may find ourselves, if we are praying, number one thing, we must pray to the living God. Not to a dead God, not to an idol. We must pray to the living God. Number two, we must pray in line with the spirit mind. Do you remember what the Bible says? We do not know what we are to pray for. But then the spirit himself, he prays within us. And through him and by him, by his grace, as we pray, we are able to alter those words that we might not have been able to alter before, except by the help of the Spirit of God. Pray in line with the Spirit's mind. Number three, in accordance with God's revealed will in Scripture. While we pray, the Scripture must be before us, so to say. The promises must be before us, so to say. Its revealed will must be before us, so to say. Because if God is to honor our prayer, answer our prayer, it must be according to the revealed will of God in his word. Number four, you pray in the name of Jesus Christ. We are not allowed, we are not permitted to pray in the name of an angel or of a man. Only in the name of Jesus, our Redeemer. Only in the name of Jesus, our Advocate. Only in the name of Jesus, the great sacrifice between, that made the way for us to be able to approach the throne of grace. When we pray, we pray only through that high priest that stands between man and God, 
through the great Messiah mediator, Jesus Christ. That is how to pray. Remember again, we pray to God, the living God. In line with the spirit mind. In accordance with God's revealed will in scripture. I will pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. In the passage I've read to you, Colossians chapter 4, verses 2, 3, and 4, there are three points that stand out very clearly. Number one, constancy in prayer. Number two, watchfulness and thanksgiving. Number three, request for prayer. Let's look at them one by one. Telling the Lord, as we look at this scripture, praying unto God silently, quietly, as we look at this scripture, that God will help us to know the meaning, to get the meaning, and to have the meaning injected so much into us that every part of us will be praying unto the Lord and will be able to pray according to the directives of scripture so that there will be power, there will be authority in our lives and our prayer life will become a change agent not just for our own individual life, but a change agent for the society in which we live. Number one, constancy in prayer. Colossians chapter 4, verse 2. Continue in prayer. Paul the Apostle writing to the Colossian believers, telling them continue in prayer. In the same way, it's writing to the whole church, because the whole Bible is given to the whole church. For a whole generation, from generation to generation, until we see the Lord face to face, this word has been given to us. And this is the word of the Lord for you and for me. Continue in prayer. It's already assumed that we have started praying. That's why it says you have started, continue. That's why it says you have begun, continue. That's why it's saying you got into the kingdom of God by praying you will continue in that prayer so that you can be established in the kingdom of God. Didn't we pray the prayer of repentance? Didn't we look up to the face of Jesus Christ in faith? Didn't we pray that prayer of assurance when we came into the kingdom of God? Didn't we make a request that sins should be forgiven, that our sins should be overlooked, and that we should be counted as children of God, as we turned away from sin and we came into the kingdom of God at the very beginning, he said, you started the prayer life. Now, continue. He said, you have become established in the kingdom of God because you are praying. He says, now, continue in prayer. It is this constancy that the Spirit of God, through the Apostle Paul, is impressing upon the whole church that we're not just to start, where to continue. And to continue here means the steadfast in prayer. It gives the idea of perseverance in prayer. That is, already, you believe that what you're asking for is for the will of God, and it will honor God and glorify Christ. Then, be persistent in prayer, continuing in prayer without getting discouraged until the answer comes. This continuance in prayer, persistence in prayer, frequency in praying is so important. The Bible talks about it many places. Look at them. In 1 Chronicles chapter 16. 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 11. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually. You see that? It says, not just one day in the week, not just two times in the year, continually, every time, constantly, persistently, seek the face of the Lord. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. Praying always. With all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, praying always, not occasionally, always, not infrequently, when you feel like, always. Time of joy, time of sorrow, praying always. Time of victory, time of defeat, praying always. Time of abundance and time of need, praying always. 
time when you are alone, time when you are in fellowship with other people, praying always. Time when you are in the church, time when you are with unbelievers outside, praying always. Time when things are going fine, and times when things are not going fine, praying always. Times when there are family difficulties, and times when there are family difficulties, praying always. Times when you are doing so much for the Lord, much activity for the Lord, and times when you are not so busy in real activities, praying always. You see that? We have to be constant in praying. Praying always, all the time. Praying without ceasing. Isn't that what the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17. Pray without ceasing. Can I just tell you that this is a commandment of Scripture. And a commandment are supposed to be obeyed. It says praying without ceasing. Prayer cannot be too much. Prayer cannot be too frequent. We pray in the morning. We pray while we're going out. We pray while we're at work. We pray while we're coming back. We pray when any new difficulty or problem or temptation arises. We pray when answered has come for our prayers. We pray when things are going well, when things are not going well. Pray without ceasing. You see, if you obey the commandment of the Lord, you will find strength when you are weak. You'll find joy when you are sorrowful. You'll find authority when it appears that people are putting your back on the wall. And you will find that God will be supporting you. You'll find that God will be leading you on. He will be supplying all your needs, spiritual needs, material needs, physical needs, according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. If you will obey the commandment of Scripture, praying without ceasing. Instead of getting discouraged, pray without ceasing. Instead of grumbling and complaining, pray without ceasing. Instead of envying other people what they have got and what we have not got, pray without ceasing. Instead of crying and being sorrowful as orphans that have no heavenly father, pray without ceasing. Instead of allowing the devil to terrify you, pray without ceasing. Instead of falling to temptation when temptations and trials come, pray without ceasing. Instead of complaining about your dryness and lukewarmness, pray without ceasing. Instead of saying that you are denied about your rights, people are not giving your rights unto you, pray without ceasing. The Lord wants us to continue in prayer. Always praying, always praying, making our needs known unto God by prayer and supplication. Acts of the Apostles chapter 6. Acts of the Apostles chapter 6. Verse 4, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the world. Here the apostles talked about the ministry of the world. But he said even before then, before preaching, there must be praying. You see why sometimes the ministry of the world is not very effective? Because it is not preceded by much praying. Because it is not saturated with much praying. Because it is not followed up with much praying. Before, during, and after the ministration of the word, as we much, much pray. We will give ourselves continually to prayer. You know the reason why many of us misfire when we preach? Because we do not pray. To know what we should be preaching about before we even preach. You know why the word of God is not like fire in our mouth and not effective on the people we are preaching to? Because we do not give ourselves to much praying before preaching the word. You know why the people who hear the word of God may not be challenged, may not be convicted, may not be compelled to fall on their faces before the Lord? Because we do not pray enough. It says we will give ourselves continually to prayer. You know why we do not touch heaven? You know why we do not pull the cord of the bell of heaven? You know why we do not get heaven's attention? Because... We only pray occasionally. We pray spasmodically. That means uh, we may just rise up and pray now, and then we cool down for the next one month, no real, serious, strong, fervent prayer again. But you see, these people, the early church, they touched heaven. They rang the bells of heaven. They got heaven's attention because they said they made a vow. They made a commitment. 
and decide themselves to this decision, we will give ourselves continually, continually to pray and then to the ministry of the world. They must have remembered what Christ told them before he went away in Luke chapter 18. Verse 1, and he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to pay. Men ought always to pray and not to get discouraged. Men ought always to pray and not to give up. Men ought always to pray and not to be sad and despondent. Men ought always to pray and not to go about grumbling and complaining, I don't know why the judge is not giving me my rights. Men ought always to pray and not to faint, not to give up the ghost, but to make a spirit alive, to be earnest, to be fervent, looking up unto God that his request will be given unto him by the Lord. Jesus said, men ought always, always, always to pray, not to faint. In Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verse 12. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing in science in prayer. Why are people hopeless? Because they do not continue in science in prayer. You know, at a time of prayer, when you are really talking to the Lord, the Lord will send a spirit. The Lord will send the word that even in a hopeless situation, the prayerful man, the prayerful woman will receive hope. Why are we not patient in tribulation? Why can we not bear the trials, the troubles, the temptations coming our way? Why is it we're always in a hurry? Once a little trouble, little tribulation comes, want to get out of it. We're already flying here and flying there, wanting to get out of the thing. We're not patient in tribulation. It's because of the lack of prayer. You see, a person that really prays, he can say in that lion's den, he'll not feel any hurt. He'll be patient there until the king will call him out, servant of the Most High God, come out here. You know, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. A person may be in the fire of tribulation if you are praying. You'll be patient there because right in that fire, the appearance of the fourth person, and the fourth person, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, will be in fellowship with you there at the place of prayer. And you will be patient in tribulation because you are continuing in science in prayer. You see, prayer is very important in our lives. We cannot do without praying. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Be careful for nothing. That means be worried about nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Everything, every time, everywhere, let it be time of praying. You'll make your prayer supplication known unto God. The thanksgiving also. But we need to say this. That there are many people that pray frequently, regularly, so many times, and yet prayers are not answered for them. You know why? Many of these people do not take care to know the conditions of answered prayer. If our prayers are going to be answered, we need to look at the conditions marked out in the Bible. Look at your outline. There's so much here. It says, as we continue persistently in prayer, we must make sure that we are not living in disobedience. We are not living in any secret thing. We are not indifferent, despising the law of God, neglecting to show mercy, committing iniquity against God, stubbornness and selfish motive all hinder prayer from being answered. Prayers that are not in accord with the divine will will not be answered. For our prayers to be answered, we must deal with every known thing we did ruthlessly with every known thing, uncompromisingly with every known thing. You need to repent, you need to make restitution, you deal with that thing adequately. If your prayers are really going to be answered, then you seek God wholeheartedly. Then you are obedient to the revealed will and word of God. You have faith in God also. Let's look at them. Look at a few of them one by one. In Deuteronomy chapter 1. Deuteronomy chapter 1. From verse 42. And the Lord said unto me, Say unto them, Go not up, neither fight, 
for I am not among you, lest ye be smitten before your enemies. What happened here is that the children of Israel had disobeyed the Lord. Some people were chosen as spies to go out and search the land. They came back. They brought an evil report, and the people began to cry, and they said they will not go out. Eventually, judgment came. By from what God revealed unto Moses, eventually the people said in verse 41, Then ye answered and said unto me, We have sinned against the Lord. We will go up and fight according to all that the Lord our God commanded us. And when ye had girded on every man his weapons of war, ye were ready to go up into the hill. And the Lord said unto me, Say unto them, Go not up. The Lord told them it was too late now to go up that they should not go. But the people were going to disobey. The people were going to follow after their own self-will. And they were going to stubbornly rebel against the word of the Lord. Because of that, they went. Look at verse 43. So I spake unto you, and ye would not hear, but rebelled against the commandment of the Lord, and went presumptuously up into the hill. And the Amorites which dwelt in that mountain came against you and chased you as these do, and destroyed you in fear, even unto Hormon. Why? Why wasn't their prayers answered? Why didn't God regard their request? Verse 45. And ye returned and wept before the Lord, but the Lord will not hearken to your voice, nor give ear unto you. You see, if we live in disobedience, the Lord will not hear our prayers. There are many places where you have prayer sessions. They do not take care to repent. They do not take care to make right their ways and have conscience void of offense toward God and man. They do not take care to live holy before the Lord, and yet they pray, and their prayers are not answered because they are living in disobedience. Other people are living in secret sin. In Psalm 66, verse 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Sometimes we find people that covenant together to be prayer partners. And they pray, and they pray, and they pray. And yet there is no answer. Because one of those ladies that pray their prayer partners are living in secret sin. And God knows every heart. By him actions are weighed. He knows what we do behind the curtain. He knows what we do in behind closed doors. Even when the prayer partner is not there, he knows what we're doing. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Sometimes we'll find some people that come together in having night vigil. During the day, they've gone into sin. Or they've been living in secret sin behind uh, the door. And because of that secret sin, even when they come together and they say they're having that vigil, there's no answer to their prayers. Other people will go to the mountain top frequently. And they will lie down there. They will fast. They will seek the face of the Lord. And yet there is no answer. You know why? If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Some people are indifferent to the word of God, to the teachings of Scripture. And when the word of God is commanding them, saying this is what to do, and the Lord is giving them directions as to say, go this way, go that way, this is my will, this is the direction to go, they do not obey. They shrug the shoulders, they are indifferent, they are nonchalant about it, and their prayers are not answered. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 24. Because I have called and you refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But ye have said, Hath not all my counsel, and would none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity, I will mock when your fear cometh, when your fear cometh like, like a desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you. Then shall they cry upon me. Shall they call upon me? And I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me, for that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel, they despised all my reproof. The Lord might be talking to you about marriage, 
and you disregard him. The Lord may be talking to you about what work to do and what work not to do, and you disregard him. The Lord says, if you disregard his counsel, his leading, his instruction, then when you pray, he will turn deaf ears unto you. Look at Proverbs chapter 21, verse 13. Proverbs 21, verse 13. Whoso suffereth his ears at the cry of the poor, he also shall cry himself, but shall not be heard. If we refuse to be merciful, if people are pleading with us to show mercy unto them, and it is in the power of our hands to show mercy unto them, and we refuse, we too will pray and God will not answer. You see, this is why the pure life is very necessary. A holy life is very necessary. Righteousness is very necessary. Because if we're living in disregard of the doctrine of holiness, doctrine of righteousness, our prayers will not be answered. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 9. He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. There are people that will disregard the doctrine of restitution. And the Bible says you turn your ears away from the law of God, from the word of God. Even your prayer will be abomination. Some people say they found a church, they found a fellowship, they found a gathering where they pray and pray and pray very much. Therefore, they want to leave this church where the doctrine of the word of God is laid line upon line, precept upon precept. They want to go to a place where they are praying and praying and praying. Prayer is good. Prayer is wonderful. Prayer is the hand that pulls the hand of the Almighty God and brings Heaven down brings blessings down, but if those people disregard doctrine, the doctrine of repentance, the doctrine of restitution, the doctrine of holiness without which no man shall see the Lord, the doctrine of making our way right in the sight of God, the doctrine of finding out, searching out the will of God before we get into marriage, the doctrine of not being unequally yoked together with unbelievers, the doctrine that we're not going to sell cigarettes, alcohol, or anything that will destroy our neighbor, the doctrine that we're going to be just and upright and righteous every time. If those people disregard the doctrines of the Bible, the law of God, even their prayers will be abomination in the sight of the law. But let's make sure that we're obedient to the word of God. And then you will find that prayer will be powerful. Prayer will be mighty. In First John chapter 3, verse 22, First John chapter 3, verse 22. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandment, and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. You see why prayers are answered? Because we're obedient, because we're humble, because we seek the face of the Lord, because we regard the law of God as very central in our decisions and actions. It says in this place that because we receive, we, we keep his commandments, then, and we are doing those things that are pleasing in his sight, then whatever we ask, we receive of the Lord. You see the righteous as bold as a lion, even in their prayers. Have you watched Moses pray, bold as a lion? Have you watched Abraham praying, bold as a lion? Did you see when Jacob prayed, I will not let you go except to bless me, bold as a lion. Have you seen Daniel before the throne of God praying? Praying for the whole nation, bold as a lion. Have you seen Jesus Christ standing at the grave of Lazarus, lifting up his eyes unto the Father and uttering those powerful authoritative words, bold as a lion. Have you seen the Apostle Paul praying either by the seashore either in the open or praying in the church, bold as a lion. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth more. But not only those of generations past long, long ago in Bible times. Let me just tell you this about Martin Luther. In 1540, just about 450 years ago, Luther's great friend and assistant, Frederick Myconius, became sick. And he was at the point of death. And on his deathbed, this friend, Frederick, wrote a farewell note to Martin Luther with, trembling, with a trembling hand. Luther received that letter, and he prayed, and instantly he sent the reply back. 
here is part of the reply. Let me read it to you. He said, I command thee in the name of God not to die, but live. I still have need of thee in the work of reforming the church. The Lord will never let me hear that thou art dead, but will permit thee to survive me, that is for you to live even beyond me. For this I am praying, for this I have prayed, and it will be done, because I seek only to glorify the name of God. Think about that authority. Think about such power. Think about that boldness. Before the throne of grace, praying unto the Lord, was the result of that prayer one week later. Myconius Frederick recovered. What is more, he continued to live until Martin Luther died. And it was only two months after Martin Luther had died that this friend that Martin Luther prayed for died. You see, God answered that prayer to every detail. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man, not of a wicked man, not of a licentious woman, not of a simple man or woman, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man, not of a hypocrite, not of a person that has a dubious character, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth more. How I pray that God will make us, help us to be righteous, fully righteous, wholeheartedly righteous, here within and without. And when we pray, when we pray, God will answer prayer. Let's go back to Colossians chapter 4. Verse 2. Colossians chapter 4. Verse 2. Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. Point 2 here talks about watchfulness and thanksgiving. Two things in this point 2. Number 1, watch. Number 2, be thankful. Let's pick them up one by one. To watch means that we must be away. You cannot be dozing and watching, sleeping and watching. If you know anything about watchmen, they ought to keep awake. They must keep awake. And when it says they are continuing in prayer and watching in the same, that is in that prayer, make sure you are awake. Make sure that you are not sleeping while you are praying. Let me ask you, if a person says he's praying, he kneels now on the bed or by, beside the bed, and then, after two, three minutes, he has dozed off, he has left off. That's not real fervent praying. That's not prayer of authority. That's not a kind of prayer that will be answered. You will never see that people in the Bible who prayed and they were answered, you will not see they were sleeping while they were praying. If somebody is praying and yawning, praying yet tired, praying and the mind is wandering, to the wilderness and wandering to the job and wandering to the market and wandering to the village. A person that is praying on the heart is wandering. That's not keeping away. That's not really praying the way we ought to pray. Therefore, it means make sure that you are watching. Make sure you stay awake. Make sure that your heart centers on God, on the throne of God, on the promises of God. Make sure that your mind, your heart, is not wandering here and there while you are praying. We must be watchful against all distractions. You see, there are some people, while they are praying, they will be shaking the head and shaking the body to keep themselves awake, and yet they keep their eyes open. They'll be looking at their children. They'll be looking at what is going on all around. They'll be looking at the vehicles that is passing uh, over through the window. They'll be seeing everything. You are, you are having distractions, and you are not really praying in the real sense of praying. But you see, you must be watchful against all temptations of the enemy of our soul. That means before we even come to the place of praying, all through the day we are watching. If the devil can make you the man, always be looking at the half-dressed ladies during the day. If the devil can make you a woman or a man watching television, watching or in the cinema houses, if the devil can make you to be seeing the sides that are not right, that will corrupt the mind. You see, in the evening when you say you come back at home and you want to pray, the moment you close your eyes, you'll be seeing the pictures you saw before during the day. You'll be seeing the pictures you saw on television. That's why we say, get all these temptations, all these distractions away from your life, and then you can really pray. You see, we must be watchful against all the traps and the pitfalls in our path. The moment you want to pray, 
The devil may bring traps and pitfalls. They bring suggestions and ideas. But you will watch against them. You will close your mind against them. It is only then you can pray the way you ought to pray. Be watchful. And as we look at the word of God, we see that in the word of God, watchfulness is connected with praying in many, many places. Let me show you a few. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. I'm trying to show you the connection between praying and watchfulness. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto. And watching thereunto. With all perseverance and supplication for all things. You will see there that watchfulness is connected with our praying. In Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. Reading from verse 41. Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. A person may say, Lord, I'm praying, keep me away from temptation. You watch as those temptations are coming, run away from them. A person may have a girlfriend and say, oh Lord, I'm, I'm praying that you'll keep me away from fornication, but you are not watching. You will cut off that girlfriend if you really do not want to fall into the temptation of immorality. A person may be in a nice club where other people are drinking and dancing, and he says, oh Lord, keep me away from drunkenness and keep me away. I am praying that I will not fall into all this sin of, a, of a drunkenness. Well, if you are really praying seriously that God will keep you away from that kind of temptation, watch against it. Then you will not go to those places where those evil things are going on. A person is saying, Oh Lord, there is idolatry in our village. And I am praying that you will help me. I will not worship idols. Then he goes home during the time of idol festival. Then you are not watching. You will pray. You will watch. Watchfulness is connected with praying. A person is praying, Oh Lord, keep me, keep our family from family trouble. And all these uh, discussions that will normally lead into quarreling and fighting, Oh Lord, bring peace in our family. And then eventually the husband says something instead of she, the woman, watching, saying, Oh Lord, I will not open my mouth. I will not give a bad answer. I will not give an answer that will, that will bring up anger for my husband. But instead of watching, the woman will not watch. The woman will reply in a bad word. And then fighting, quarreling will begin again. And will say, God did not answer my prayer because you prayed without watching. Make sure that you are watching and praying. Now let me tell you something and you have to pay attention now to understand. Married people, they are praying that God will give them children. And you know the cycle of the married woman. And when you come together at such a time, then it is possible because that is a period that the woman can easily get pregnant. But at such a time, it's when quarreling comes. At such a time, it's when they do not watch. And then they will sleep in different rooms at such a time. And they say, God does not answer my prayer. I've been praying God will give me children. And children have not come. Watch. That at that time when there is the possibility, biologically, in the body of the woman, to be able to get pregnant, watch that you don't allow disagreement and all these evil things to come. Let there be love every time. Let there be humility in the, in the family every time. Watch and pray. Make sure that your prayer is connected with watchfulness. A time is going. Let me just uh, talk to you about thankfulness. You see, praying is also connected with thankfulness. Prayer should not stand alone. Prayer should not stand alone. You see, a one-legged chair will not stand. A person that is always making petition, request, petition, request, only one leg, always asking, always asking. No praise of the Lord. No thanksgiving unto the Lord. A person like that will not easily have the prayers answered. Number one, let there be watchfulness in your praying. And let there be thanksgiving in your praying. In First Chronicles chapter 16. First Chronicles chapter 16, from verse 8. Give thanks unto the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. Sing unto him. Sing psalms unto him. 
Talk ye of all his wondrous works. Glory ye in his holy name. Let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually. Remember his marvelous works that he has done, his wonders and his judgment, the judgment of his mouth. That is telling us that we ought to make sure that we are glorifying the Lord. We have a heart and attitude of gratitude in our prayers all the time. We must always be thankful. What are we thankful for? Oh, we are thankful for our salvation. We are thankful for our fellowship in Christ and fellowship with Christ. We are thankful for the privilege of serving the Lord. We are thankful for answered prayers. Even before we receive answers to the present request, we must be thankful for all past mercies. Always be grateful, always be thankful. That means when you come before the Lord in prayer, you are not grumbling, you are not complaining, you are not insulting the majesty of the Most High by saying, what have you done for me? I've been coming to church all this while. I've been praying to you all this while. What have I got? You are not coming with envy. Other people have got this and I have not got it yet. Why is it my prayer has not been answered? You are not coming with complaints, with murmuring. You are coming with thankfulness. Will you watch your heart? That your heart will not be negative at the time of prayer. That's how God will answer our prayer. Let's look at Psalm 92, verse 1. Psalm 92, verse 1. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord, to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High. Now in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 20. Still talking about appraising the name of the Lord, uh, being grateful unto the Lord, rendering our gratitude unto the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Giving thanks always, morning, afternoon, and evening, giving thanks always. When the answers come speedily and when the answers are delayed a little, giving thanks always. All things, even when you go through persecution, that the Lord is giving you the strength to bear, to endure that persecution, giving thanks always for all things. When it appears we do not have enough material things, giving thanks always for the spiritual things you have. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, it is that right attitude. It is that good nature that is able to get much from the hand of the Lord. Remember point two, watchfulness in a time of prayer, before prayer, during prayer, after prayer, watchfulness. Remember always, thanksgiving. Make sure you approach the throne of grace and the court of God with thanksgiving, with gratitude from your heart. Now we look at point three. Point three, requests for prayer. Let's look at Colossians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. Without praying also for all, that God will open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bond, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. The first thing I want to notice there, which I also want you to notice, my brothers and sisters, is the humility of the great Apostle Paul. When you look at people in the, in the whole Bible, in the whole Bible, and you compare Paul with any character, any personality in the Bible, apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, we might say that he goes head and shoulders above everyone in the whole Bible. The revelations, the mysteries, the great things that God revealed unto Paul the Apostle and the visions he had and also the great work that he did. The great apostle he was, the great prophet he was, the great mighty evangelist, missionary he was, the great pastor with a shepherd heart, with a father's heart that he had the great teacher, a teacher, a preacher of the gospel that he was and yet humble enough to say, Pray for us. Pray for us. Telling the uh, church at Colossae 
the believers, the saints at Colossae, saying, without praying also for us. Now I want to tell you that it wasn't this only time that uh, Paul the Apostle said, pray for us. Look at Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15, verse 30. Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake, and for the love of the Spirit, that he strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. You see that? He said, pray for me, great apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, preacher. Pray for me. You see, that shows the humility of the great apostle. He knew that it wasn't his talent, it wasn't his gift, it wasn't his ability, it wasn't his strong constitution that did everything that he did. How every one of us should be that humble, that humble, that we will be able to ask from the others to pray for us. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 25. Brethren, pray for us. You see here Paul the Apostle again requesting for prayer. So number one, it shows us the humility of Paul the Apostle. Now I pray that every one of us will manifest genuine humility from the heart. Another thing we notice from his prayer, let's come back to Colossians chapter 4, from verses 3 and 4, is the nature of his prayer request. And this is very, very important, very, very important, the nature of his prayer request. The request was not for any personal need. His petition was just that God will give him the privilege to open his mouth boldly to preach the word of God. His prayer requests that he also preach the word of God that many more people will be getting saved. You see, our prayer requests often show what is most important to us. If earthly material things are the most important to us, that will, that will show in our prayer. If temporal perishable things of this world are what we count the most essential, that will show in our prayer. If earthly comfort, fleshly ease, and the things that are greatest desires, our prayer requests will show. And it will thus reveal our low, pitiable, spiritual level. But to see Paul the Apostle, he was concerned for the expansion of the kingdom of God. And this should be our request also, our concern also. Our concern should not be for self, it should be for the expansion and establishment of the kingdom of God. You see, the early church demonstrated such concern. They wanted just the glory of God and the salvation of souls. So must be our concern today as we reveal it in our prayer request. Let me read this to you again. Very important. Colossians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. Look at his request. Without praying also for us, that God will open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ. For the which I am also in bond. He said, I've been preaching. He said, I'm even suffering for it. He said, I'm writing from the prison right now. He said, my legs and my hands have been in the chains and in bonds all the same. Only pray that God will give me more opportunity to speak the mystery of Christ. He says, I have a message greater than all the raw laws and edicts of Rome. I have a message that will transcend and go beyond even the whole world when all of heaven and earth are passed away. This message will still be very important because the reaction to the message of salvation now is what determines where you spend eternity. It says, pray for me. I'm not praying that I should be free from the bonds. I'm not praying there should be no persecution. I'm not praying there should be no earthly need. I'm not praying that there should be no suffering at all. Just pray for me, he said, that God will open unto me and unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bond, that I may make it manifest. It says, where I am is not the important thing. In the prison, pray for me, I'll make it manifest. In the palace, I'll make it manifest. Before Agrippa, I made it manifest. I still want to make it manifest before other people. He said, pray for me, that I will make it manifest and Speak as I ought to speak. Was this the only time he made such a request? Oh no. This was his consuming passion. His consuming desire. It's uh, up the thing that was uppermost in his heart. His greatest prayer request. Look at it again in Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. 
from verse 19 and verse 20. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. This is what he wanted, that he'll be able to speak the word of God without fear, without favor. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, brethren, pray for us. What's the prayer request here now? That the word of the Lord may have free cause and be glorified even as it is with you. You can see then the prayer request. And this ought to be a concern. Our prayer request will generally show whether we're spiritual or we are carnal. The own prayer request show that he was spiritual. Now, as we end, please remember this. As Paul expected the Colossians to pray for him and for others, so we must pray for others frequently. What are the things we ought to be praying for? And who are the people we ought to be praying for? Well, the word of God has a lot to say as to the things and who we are praying for. Number one, we ought to be praying for the kingdom of God, the expansion of the kingdom of God, the upliftment of the kingdom of God, the establishment of the, of the kingdom of God. Isn't that the way Jesus taught the disciples and us how to pray? He said, after this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Then he said, thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. We must always pray for the expansion, the establishment, the upliftment of the kingdom of God. Number two, we must pray for the preacher. Pray for the preacher. Pray for the preacher. That the word of God will have free course uh, through the preacher. Number three, we are to pray for the church. That God will open the eyes of members of the church. That God will make the church spiritual. That every stain, every spot, everything that is sinful, God will take away from his church and make the church strong, prepared a bride for the coming of the Lord. Number four, we ought to pray for the nation, that people in the nation will be saved. We ought to agonize, we ought to pray, travail in prayer, that the people in the nation will be saved. We ought to pray for the leaders in the nation, for the leaders in the nation, that God will give them wisdom, that they will direct the nation in such a way, will be able to live peaceable lives. Then we have to pray for individual believers. You know what Jesus said to Peter? He said, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you like wheat. But then he said, I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. We have to pray one for another. Then we have to pray for sinners. What do we pray? How do we pray for sinners? That God will seek them out, find them out, convict them of their sins, compel them to bow the knee for the Lord Jesus Christ, to repent and believe on the Lord. We ought to pray for sinners. As soon as Zion travailed, it brought forth its children. Then we ought to pray for our persecutors and enemies. Pray for our persecutors and enemies. That is the word of the Lord. For the real children of God. Here is what Jesus said. He said, but I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And then he said, pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that she may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. Pray for your enemies and for your persecutors, and then pray for family members. Today we have learned about prayer, and we have learned we ought to continue in prayer, and we are going to rise up now. We are going to make it practical. We have been taught. You see, whenever we are taught, we should do what the Lord is telling us to do. And we should even make a commitment to the Lord that it will not only be now, we will make a commitment and make a vow and make a consecration unto the Lord that we will continue in prayer. When we're weak, when we're strong, we'll continue in prayer. Rise up on your feet and begin to talk to the Lord. Begin to talk to the Lord and watch against any distraction. Watch against anything that will make you to be absent-minded. Arise and pray. Talk to the Lord in prayer that the Lord will glorify himself. Pray for the kingdom of God and pray for spiritual things, spiritual things. Let spiritual things be more in your prayer request, in your petition, than the things that are material, things that are temporal. 
Continue in prayer. Continue in prayer. Let the word of the Lord dwell in you richly as you pray so that the word of the Lord will be your guide in praying. If you have not been saved, you ought to pray so you'll be saved. If you have not been sanctified, you ought to pray so that you'll be really sanctified. Made holy before the Lord. Remember, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Are you getting ready for the coming of the Lord? Arise and pray. Are you may baptize in the Holy Ghost. Are you an effective soul winner before the Lord? Are you bearing your cross and bearing the yoke peacefully and lovingly without complaining and grumbling? Do you have enough spiritual strength? Are you standing upright in the strength of the Lord? Talk to the Lord in prayer. Make a commitment to the Lord that you will never stop obeying the Lord. You'll pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Make sure that your spiritual in your prayer request don't let all your prayer requests be on temporal things, on things of no value, on things that will never take you beyond this world. Make sure you are born again. Make sure you have repented. Make sure that you are praying that you have grace. Make right everything in your life so that whenever the Lord will come, you will not be ashamed on that day. Continue in prayer.